Perfect. Well, welcome everyone to Next Level by Association. Uh, members, you know how this how this works. Um, guests, if you're on as a guest, uh, just know that um, this is something that's being recorded. It is something that will uh, will appear in the Facebook membership group. So if you're a member, you'll have access to it later. If you're not, you won't see it uh, again after this point. So um, that being said, you know, um, we've been doing this 10 years now. And so I want to play a quick video just so you guys can get an idea of, uh, of everything that, uh, that we've been through in the last 10 years. It's been a blast. But um, sometimes, sometimes it gets lost in translation when we don't get to see uh, exactly where something came from. And uh, so tonight, let me just play this quick video and uh, give you guys some ideas of some of the things that, that have happened. Next Level by Association is really about connecting and creating an intentional peer group of people that are really committed at the highest level to getting to their next level personally and professionally. And what I learned is that you have good days and you have bad days, but you don't know which is which because you don't know what you're going to make of the experience. Why is it that a Navy SEAL who has put it all on the line, if he says the scariest, most difficult thing I've ever done is to start and run my own business, why do we think that we can do it by ourselves? Who read the book The Secret? I got a secret, get off your ass and do something. <laughs> and if you know what you're doing, show up on time with a smile on your face and do your job, you will always have a job. And then he also added to that, and by the way, the man who knows how will always have a job working for the man who knows why. When you take what they have to say, you know that if you're going to apply it to your life, that it's going to create an impact. It's a support group for overachievers. Well, welcome everyone. This is your next level tune-up. This is the way that you stay engaged in, uh, in the process of growing personally and professionally. Maybe you think I'm at a level eight in that standard. What if you just raise it up to a nine? How would that affect your life? We come together to get inspired and motivated, but more importantly, to take action. What is the next action we're gonna to take to get to that next level? become a family and a family of people that got your back and, and sincerely want you to reach your next level. I wrote a book, which I never thought I would. When people push you to, and make you strive further and, and push harder. You go to the damn next level through the front door, the back door, the side door, the chimney, somehow. That's how you go. And you go when you want it bad enough. Every next level of your life will demand, not request, every next level of your life will demand a different you. All right. Well, welcome. Uh, you guys, you guys are in for a treat tonight. Um, we have somebody that I met online. If you guys haven't experienced Clubhouse yet, Check it out. It's a great format, a great platform to really connect with some people, have some great conversations, and uh, some amazing people have, have been through there, such as Janine Driver. Janine Driver has uh, worked with ATF for 17 years, uh, and she is the, the epitome of an expert because not only has she studied it and learned it, but she's mastered it by actually having to implement it. You know, if you talk to me earlier today, I, I was mentioning, I said, you know, something about, you know, what would it be, how valuable would it be to your business or to your career or to your relationships if you could understand and master the art of reading people and understanding body language? Well, she's had to do it to, for her life. Her life literally depended on her ability to do that. So uh, with that being said, Janine, welcome. Thanks, Bob. I'm, I'm excited to be here. 
take it to the next Absolutely. level. Likewise. So you gotta, you gotta tell us, okay, female joining ATF uh, 17 years ago, why, 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 why? And, and what was the, well, we'll get to the next experience, but why then and why that? Well, I'm 50 and I like, I just turned 50 in June. So I say I'm barely out of my forties or I sometimes say a stone throw out of my thirties. Either way it works there for me. But I didn't join ATF 17 years ago. I joined when I was 21. So back in 1992, right out of college and was there for 17 years. And uh, I never heard of them, right? ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. My dad said, I, I'm his daughter who turned her hobbies into a career, drinking, smoking and shooting. And I don't do any of those things, Bob, half as much as I used to. And uh, so, I never heard of ATF. As a matter of fact, I thought ATF was part of the FBI. Even when I got the job, I, I was telling people I'm working for a division within the FBI. But ATF is, is the original Elliot Ness. So ATF was originally not under justice. When I came on board, it was under the Treasury Department. So it goes back to those prohibition days. And Elliot Ness was essentially the first ATF agent. So they came to my school. I'll tell you, I've just been one of these people I've always I come from a blue collar family out of Boston. My dad is a firefighting mechanic. So he fixes fire trucks for a living. He's 74 now, he retired two years ago. My mom has since passed, but she was a nurse for elderly homeless people, Bob, in Boston, Massachusetts. And so I come from this blue collar, hardworking family. And my mom and dad just would always say, if you wanna do something right, do it right the first time. I remember once they, uh, they put in skylights in their, in their kitchen my father put a contract uh, to the contractor. He wants extra insulation up there because it's Boston, right? And he wants extra insulation. The guy goes contract because you don't need it, Charlie. That's my dad. You don't need it, Charlie. You don't need extra insulation. My father goes, I want it. He comes in. My dad one day pays extra for it. The wall is halfway done, sealed up. My father can see there's no insulation in there. My father goes, rip it down, do it over. I want insulation. Again, the contractor goes, I told you, you don't need it. My father said, and I'll never forget, I was there. He said, yeah, I don't need socks in the winter either, but I wear them, put the insulation in. If you're gonna do something right, do it right the first time. So I was just raised with this very gritty blue collar um, drive. And my family is always, they're always the best version of themselves when they're serving others. So whether it was my dad fixing fire trucks and, and caring about the firefighters going home to their families or my mom helping elderly homeless people um, they would take them into these little mini apartments and my mother would be the nurse in one of them, uh, which is unbelievable to me, patients of a saint. And uh, so when I was in college, I worked at the Career Development Center. I went to school in the Berkshires. And to make a long story short, there was a guy, Ron, who didn't like our boss, Sharon. Sharon was a tough pill to swallow and Ron didn't like her. And this was back in like 90, 90 and 91. And I was, had an internship there and he asked me if I would help him on the QT at night write out his resume cover letters and send it to job announcements in a thing called the newspaper. So okay. there'd be an ad in the newspaper for a job and I would type up cover letters. He would rip them out and I would do them every night on the QT. And Sharon Zavataro, one time our boss found out and she pulled me aside and said, are you doing this for Ron at night? And I said, yes, I am. And she was, that's not part of your internship. You don't have to do that. I go, I don't mind Sharon. I go, I don't, I don't mind. I, I'm my best version of me when I'm serving others. I don't mind. Mm -hmm. And Lo and behold, that guy, Ron, his roommate in college was a guy named Fran Flaherty. Fran Flaherty was the ATF supervisor in Hartford, Connecticut. Fran Flaherty was told by the only woman that worked in, in, among the investigators, Regina Domingo, you hired four men in a row. The next time you hire someone, if it's not a woman, I'm filing a grievance with ATF. So he came to my college, called his old college buddy, Ron, who I'm typing cover letters for every night and said, I need to hire a woman. Do you have anyone in mind? And he said, boy, do I have someone for you. And that's how I got the job at an agency I knew nothing about. That is incredible. How cool is that? What, what a great ripple effect story, right? That is powerful. Yeah. What, so, thank you know, you. I love, uh, I love so many elements of that story, but I love that statement that you said about your, first about your family and then about yourself, that you are at your best when what? Your best version of yourself when what? When I'm serving others, when I'm serving others, mm -hmm. serving, helping, serving others. Wow. It's true. I am the best version of me when I'm serving people. That is, you know, do you find that that's true for most people? I mean, you, you, you understand human behavior. I'm a human behaviorist. And do you find that that's true of most people with they're actually better when they're serving? 
Yeah, I have a um, picture of my mother. Maybe I'll grab it at the end here uh, up on the wall that I keep outside the bathroom because if I'm home alone, I keep the bathroom door open and I sit, go on the, sit on the toilet. Pretty Some private information here. We didn't know we were going there tonight. There go. But I sit on the toilet and I leave the door open and I look at my mother's this big like 11 by 14 picture of my mom's headshot up there. And I, and I talk to her and on that picture, it says your power is what you give to others. And so my mother used to say to this, say to me, Bob, all the time, and you listening on Facebook Live or here on this platform on Zoom, she used to say, if I said to you, Bob, take what you need, and you take what you need, and I say to Bill here, Bill, take what you need, and Bill takes it, and Pearl, and Flo, and Michael, and I'll be left with so much more than if I try to grab and hold it. And she used to say, if you squeeze things so tight, it'll slip through your fingertips like sand. Mm. So if you just say, take what you need, take what you need, you'll be left with so much more than you would ever, ever if you held on to it. And it's interesting because I go on TV shows and like the Today Show and whatever, CNN, Fox, and if they call and I'm not available, and I'm not saying this as an ego boost, I'm just saying this as a loyalty boost, that if I'm not available and you teach body language, Bob, or, or you've you know learned something similar, I'll call you and I'll say, listen, I can't do the Today Show, Bob, but I'd love to give you this opportunity to go on the Today Show, but here's my deal. You have to say you are trained by me at the Body Language Institute. You have to, um, let me define loyalty. So loyalty to me is if the Today Show calls you, again, for a segment, you say, listen, I'd love to help you, but I have a deal with Janine. If Janine Driver's not available, then I'd be more than willing to help. But if they call, and they go, no, 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 but we want a guy for this segment. We really want you, Bob. No, well, my, that's great. My deal with Janine is that if she's not available, I'll be more than willing to help. And so I'm very clear. I'm not a pushover. I'm not just the, the person that's just going to let you step all over me. I'm the person that's going to give you an opportunity with very clear expectations. I know my value. And so I, I set up these perimeters. I had a guy, uh, I'm going through a divorce and a guy from my high school, who's a nice guy. I've been talking to him. He, I, I called him two days ago and he texted me two days ago. Hey, Janine, I'm crazy busy. Let me call you right back. A day and a half went by, day and a half, no response, nothing. So he called me just like chatting it up, like nothing as if it was five minutes from my original call. Mm. And I said to him, his name is Rob. And I said to him, Rob, uh, I want to let you know, I'm disappointed that you didn't, it took two days for you to respond to that text. I would have rather if you said, I'm crazy busy, give me a couple days and be clear. And he goes, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. This, 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 this. And this is what I said. And it's probably going to sound egotistical to the people that are listening. And that's okay. If you think it is, <laughs> is I told him you're, you responded in, in a way that you thought I was ordinary. I'm not ordinary. So you not responding for two days, that doesn't work for me because I'm not ordinary. And I'm, you know, I say, uh, if I want to attract a King, then I have to show up as a queen. I can't be showing up. You know, there's a great movie out there called The Holiday. And I don't know if you remember it, Bob. It's with uh, Cameron Diaz and Kate Winslet. And Kate Winslet and Cameron Diaz switch homes. And Kate Winslet's character goes from England over to LA. And, and, and Cameron Diaz goes from LA, heartbroken over, and they switch. And, and Kate Winslet's character goes out with this elderly next door neighbor who has like Emmys and Oscars in his house. And she kind of randomly sees that he's lost and, and out and walking around the neighborhood and becomes friends with him. And they go to dinner and he said to her, to Kate Winslet's character, I know as a fact, you're the leading lady, but you keep showing up as the best friend. Mm. When are you gonna start showing up as the leading lady? And I think men have no problem showing up as the king, but I think a lot of women, because we're so verbal and because we wanna be liked, we're emotional, we process through our hearts that if you ghost us like that for a couple of days, it's like, oh, it's okay. They give you the excuses. And I don't, I think you're gonna, you're gonna attract ordinary people. But if you wanna attract a king, then you have, to, you have to know your own worth. And there's a great book out there for any women that might be listening. And, it's, and you may have heard of it before. It's called A Woman's Worth. Hmm. Have you heard of this book, anybody? I've heard of it. I it's not. really good. It's called A Woman's Worth. Mary, Marian Williamson. And it's, it's on Audible and you can listen to it. And it's a game changer because what happens for men versus women. So men, I've just as a quick sidebar is men will, um, they, they have no problem. Male energy, masculine energy is setting parameters. It's finishing a project. When you're at work and you meet a deadline, that's masculine energy. Feminine energy is free flowing. It's nature, right? It's the ocean. It's a tsunami. Imagine trying to gift wrap a tsunami. You can't gift wrap a tsunami, right? So feminine energy is this kind of free flowing energy. It's the wind, it's the ocean. So we tend to be more flexible if you guys let us down. It's okay, we kind of move with it. 
But the men, imagine if I did that to some a guy, right? Or I blew you off from two hours late without calling. You'd be like, no, I'm good. It's unlikely the guy's going to let me in. I'm good, Janine. Mm-hmm. But the woman's like, oh, okay, and take the apology. And I think that we need to have a shift here. And so for me, as I become older, you know, out, barely out of my 40s, I, I've transitioned to be uh, less apologetic for having expectations and creating, I call them Jersey barriers, mm-hmm. right? So you got these Jersey barriers. So if you've kind of fall asleep at the wheel, it knocks you back up, it says, wake up, right? So you don't go off the rails there. So I've been working on my emotional intelligence and creating some Jersey barriers because a lot of women I think think, oh, they think I have a big ego, ooh, mm-hmm. right? And Marianne Williamson's book will say, if people think you have a big ego, you should silently think in your head as a woman, uh, you haven't seen anything yet. Wow, yeah. I've only just begun because a lot of us become full of blame and shame as, as a woman entrepreneur, successful woman entrepreneur. And I'm, and I'm not saying that in an egotistical way. I'm saying that in a very, in order for me to be successful and to take it to the next level, yeah. I need to be able to be comfortable to put those Jersey berries on. And this guy, Rob, do you know what he said to me when I said, I'm not ordinary and we all make mistakes and I get it. And I'm just letting you know, that doesn't work for me. He said, um, I kind of thought you were going to let me have it. I kind of thought you were going to let me have it because it was very rude. It wasn't nice and it's not typical of me and I'm so sorry and it will never ever happen again. Mm. And what I started to think was this, is that he was looking for that in me. He was looking for me to create the Jersey bear. He, I'm telling him how I want to be treated. Right. And I think that for me, learning that from a powerful mother, from a nurse who worked with elderly homeless people who went and got her master's degree, who was the sweetest, I'm, t- I'm a giant, you know, I'm a BB, a big bottom girl. She was tiny, five foot two, I'm five foot nine. I'm huge, right? And uh, she was just a little peanut with uh, a big heart, but you wouldn't mess around with her, so. Anyway, there's a little sidebar for you, a little bit of my character. I love that. I love that story. And uh, it, it, you know, it reminds me of, of just setting great boundaries, right? I'm, I'm a big believer on boundaries and, and I'm like you, I'm called rude a lot of times, or I'm called, and I always say, yeah. you know, the only people that call me that are people with no boundaries themselves. Um, you yes. know, those are the people that find fault with people who have boundaries. Uh, so yeah. I, man, I appreciate that about you so much. And uh, thank you for saying that. And thank you for being that because uh, I believe that we need to be a better example of what, how we want to be treated. And uh, that was a perfect illustration of doing that. So, you know, boundaries though, they can save your life. Um, And you've had to set boundaries in a lot of different ways. And you've had to learn how to develop an understanding of how people are behaving, why they're behaving a certain thing, and then being able to read them. What is some, some illustration uh, in your career where you've had to read a person or their body language uh, in such a way that it was it was potentially a life-threatening situation for you or someone else? Oh my gosh, all the time. You know, I'll, I'll take it from when I worked for ATF all the way back from being a kid. So when I was at ATF, I remember this one guy I went in, his name was Gangden O'Neill. He's probably since passed. Hmm. And uh, when I came in, I was like, I have a badge, right? 1177. I brought my badge. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm here to do an investigation. And and he was elderly and nice guy. And uh, I came in and as soon as I came in, his eyes, I mean, it was like a movie. His eyes just looked at the top of a file cabinet. And as soon as I saw his eyes, when I'm like, ATF, I'm, you know, I'm here to help. Uh, and I see his eyes go to the top of the file cabinet. I go, hmm. I wonder what's up at the top of that file cabinet. I certainly know I'm gonna find out. I certainly know I'm not leaving this area. And as you might imagine, Bob, and you at home listening on Facebook Live or here on this platform and Zoom is, is he wants to get me out of there. He's like, Janine, I got a space for you to work in. You can work back here. I'm like, ah, mm. I like the people. I like being among the people. I like it, Gangden. And when I eventually asked about, I'd like to see, what he had was a dummy book there. See, he was selling guns. He was firearms trafficking. He was elderly. Mm. He was firearms trafficking to gangbangers. And what he was doing was filing reports with the local police department saying they were kind of doing this like smash and grab, that they would smash open his front window and then reach in and grab some guns. But really, they were ordering which guns they wanted to have these gang bangers and so something as simple as just checking the eyes and same thing this is whether you're an entrepreneur a business owner a, a supervisor or a mom or a girl just wanting to be seen by a guy right it's it's just noticing these little teeny changes in someone's baseline 
that then to me say, there's more to the story here. And I like to call some of these moments, I have an expression, Bob, I call it a blue streak. A blue streak is a bolt of lightning that changes the direction of your life, right? You're out golfing or playing tennis or swimming and thunder comes and lightning comes. That blue streak is a bolt of thunder. And you go, everyone out of the pool, everyone off the golf course. Blue streaks come in positive and negative ways, right? Joseph Campbell would call it your hero's journey if something negative kind of came your way. And so for me, I call them these blue streak moments. And if, if I go back to the age of six, uh, without getting into details, I was molested by a 28 year old next door neighbor at six at one time. And then my mother was calling me for dinner while he started to do some inappropriate things to a six, six year old kid, right? That could have turned, that could have really put me down a negative path, but I swear, and my, I believe it was a blue streak to save my life 10 years later. Because what happened was I told my mother after dinner, my mother called the police and handled it with such grace because so often parents don't believe their kids. So I'm so grateful my parents believed me. And, uh, but 10 years later in 1986, you may remember a guy, a little boy named Adam Walsh was kidnapped and found beheaded. And I remember it was all over the news and uh, it scared me because I remembered this, this trauma I had at six. Well, I worked at a place called Mr. Donuts and I was riding my bike at 5 a.m. In, in a rainstorm in July or August and to get my check because my family was going camping for two weeks. And why would I need my check if I'm going camping? Well, I can't tell my parents the reason I need my check is because the owner of Mr. Donuts has a cocaine problem and I would come in and see him doing cocaine and I'm worried that the police are gonna come raid him and I'm not gonna get my check. Even if I couldn't cash it, I just wanted it in hand. So I ride my bike and I'm so stubborn even as a little kid and I ride my bike there and I get my check and I'm full of such pride. And as anyone might be in those moments where it's like people tell you you can't do it and you go and do it. And it's 2.8 miles home, about a half mile in. As I'm driving one way, a car drives the other way, pouring rain, I'm soaked, but full of like just a mass of pride. And a car's driving the other way and a guy says, hey kid, how about we put your bike in the trunk of my car and I'll give you a ride home. And I swear having that molestation happen that one time 10 years earlier, literally saved my life that day. Because mm -hmm. as soon as I looked at him, that spidey sense went off inside of me, danger. The way that when I got, I was climbing my neighbor's tree and he said, come out of the tree and let's play this fun game. And it didn't feel right. Gavin De Becker would call this from the gift of fear, the gift of fear. And I overrode my gift of fear as a kid. And so now all of a sudden, 10 years later, my gift of fear kicks in. And I, and I remember, um, I think that's what that blue streak that put me in this path to go into law enforcement happened at six is that, and then 16. Uh, and I remember thinking like a Liam Neeson movie, he will get you. You know, <laughs> scream out details. And then he picks up the phone. He's like, I will find you. I will hunt you down and I will kill you. Right. And yeah. like ahead of time. But I was thinking in my head, bike versus car, this guy's going to kidnap you, Janine. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's just not going to care if my bones are broken. He's going to hit me off my bike with his car. There's not a car on the road. It's 5 15, 5 30 in the morning on a, on a Saturday. It's pouring rain. And uh, there's a bank right there. I can't drive home, but there's a bank a block away, Bay Bank, it was called. And on the other side of Bay Bank was a, a, a big chain link fence and then about a seven foot hill down to another shopping plaza. And all I thought is uh, Adam Walsh, the grief of John Walsh talking about his son and not knowing who did it for decades. And I thought, well, my parents are gonna know who took me. I'm gonna spare them some grief give them some clue in my tiny little 16 year old brain. And I thought all I need to do, maybe the bank will have a camera. And so my goal was to ride to the bank and what I call the grace of God, I'm a swearing Christian, although I'm working on the swearing part, <laughs> by the grace of God, this chain link fence, someone had cut it open. And so that guy, lo and behold, followed me all the way to the Bay Bank and right there, right behind me. And I went through the teller machine and went, went to that fence. And I, I didn't know if I was gonna climb the fence or what I was gonna do, but there was a hole in that chain link fence. It was as if the pearly gates of God himself came and opened that up for me. Mm -hmm. And I drove down that little hill into the shopping plaza, called 911 and, and minutes later, I'm dropped off at my house while my parents are still sleeping. My two younger sisters sound asleep. The doorbell rings and I'm there with two police officers and my bike is in the trunk of their car. And they had no idea I even left the house. Wow. And I think that these moments are what I call blue streaks. 
I had a blue streak when I worked at the World Trade Center for ATF. I used to eat at the top of Tower 2 where the Dean Winter Cafeteria was. Mm -hmm. uh, ATF was in building six or seven, one of the lower buildings. There were seven buildings for the World Trade Center, I think. And I was like six or seven, I don't remember now. And But I, every morning between 8.30 and 10.30, I'd be up there at Dean Winter eating breakfast. And the only reason I left New York City is I had a boss I didn't like. Uh, her name was Colleen. Mm -hmm. And she was not, she would be like, Bob, my office now. She was all about intimidating people. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't like that. I remember as, a, as a, I'll give you a quick body language thing here. I said to my mother, this isn't going to work out well. Because when Colleen does this to, to these people, Richard and, 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 and this other woman, uh, this Richard and I think Miriam, she would say, Richard, my office. And they became like cartoon figures. Their eyes would bug out and they'd have a deep swallow, right? And I go, mom, what am I going to do when Colleen says, Janine, my office? Now my mother goes, I'll tell you what to do. So I listened to what mom said. And lo and behold, Bob and you at home, uh, Colleen said about a month in, Janine, my office now. I'm 25 years old. Don't know anyone in New York City. I come in, but I'm stubborn. And I come into our office and I did a move called steepling. And if you're watching on the camera here, you can see steepling. Uh, President Trump would do steepling. Smithers would do it. Oprah Winfrey. When we steeple people, we intimidate people. And the higher the steeple, the more we intimidate people people. So you could have a low steeple on your lap or on the table. You could do a godfather steeple here or lean back. And this is like, this is, I'm powerful. This is, I'm more powerful. This is, you people are so lucky you work for me <laughs> uh, with that hand, that steeple above your head. So I, I casually walked behind Colleen. Had you been with me at the World Trade Center, you would have seen me with my steeple casually walking by behind her. And I went in and I said, Colleen, what's going on? She was, do you know why I called you into my office? And I said, what mom told me to say, Bob. I said, I have a pretty good idea, Colleen. She was, why? I go, because I am exceeding all your expectations. And she goes, she was all confused, right? She's like, what? what? No, I'll do that at the end of the year in evaluation. I go, Colleen, spread it out. I like a lot of attention. So every now and then point me out in the crowd here and bring me in. I'll come skipping on in. Any attention I get from the boss is a win for me. Oh, I worked for her for two and a half, three years. And I left because, not because I was intimidated by her, but because I couldn't see, how, I couldn't stand by. It was a, such a toxic environment. And I went and worked at the FBI for a year in West Virginia. And from there, I then ended up going to Seattle, Washington and 9-11 happened. That boss that I had was one of the best gifts I've ever been given. Me being molested at six, I think saved my life at 16. So these blue streak moments, uh, my, my purpose in life is to inspire you to look at your world in a different way, mm. to inspire you to look at your world in a different way. So how do I take something so toxic and you know what Joseph Campbell would, get, would call again, my hero's journey, but I really do. And so when something bad is happening, even still, um, bad things happened over COVID for me. I was negotiating a half a million dollars in, in speaking events around the world, uh, everywhere from the Middle East to Europe, to Eastern Europe, to Canada, to the United States, gone in a four day window. In August, my car was repossessed out of my driveway. I was negative $4,000. I asked for my husband for, for 16 years, been with him 17 for a divorce in January. I agreed to pay his rent $2,350 a month for a year. So I'm paying his rent over the mortgage here lost health insurance for two months. I'm the mother of three boys. My youngest is six. I, I've gone through hell and back. And, and when, I, when I'm in those moments, even in the past year, I say, okay, this is an awesome, you know, uh, Joseph, Joseph Campbell would call it your call for adventure. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wayne Dyer would say, change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Yeah. Great ways. And these are things I know I'm not saying for the first time you're hearing if you're part of this next level community. I know you've heard them before, but I, I live them. I, I literally in those moments of a blue streak moment say, wow, I can't wait to see where this blue streak takes me. Wow. Those are some, some powerful stories and some, some powerful illustrations. And I, and I want to ask you because I think it's one thing to know, it's another thing to do. Um, and so when you say that these are the things that you how did you do that? I mean, there's people that are watching this or they'll be watching it and, and recording that are sitting there going, I, okay, I'm set back. I'm, I'm having to reinvent myself, reinvent my life. I'm trying, or I'm about ready to make that step of getting a divorce or doing something. What, what do you say to them? How do they do that? And then we're going to talk about some body language as well, but how, you know, you touched on such a valuable subject because so many people are in that midst right now. What do you say to them? How do they do that? I think that you need to find your people. And for me as a swearing Christian, um, I was really 
I mean, it was, I, I lost a big client ADP and they put a lot of money in my pocket because I had like a mental breakdown on a webinar with them, you know, all this racial hate, you know, I'm from law enforcement, seeing a police officer put his knee on a, on a human being and people videotaping it and watching the, and the police officer has his hand in his pocket, like he's hanging out at a bar. Mm -hmm. um, so casually, like that really in the midst of all this. And I, I feel that for me, 2020 was almost like a PTSD moment. Um, I'm not a therapist, but I, because when I saw all the hate that was happening uh, in, in 2020 um, and all the suffering just happening everywhere, uh, I was immediately pulled back for some reason, seeing human beings jumping out of the World Trade Center. And I was like putting me there where I would have been there at Dean Winter Cafeteria, that they were on fire and choosing to jump out of the World Trade Center and seeing that one particular picture, this body falling. And so I, I, I would love to say that it's easy every second of the day, it's not. So because I'm a Christian, because and it doesn't matter what you believe, you know, I have a friend, Billy Zibi, he goes to Brazil and drinks poisonous tea and prays to mother ayahuasca. Um, my brother-in-law is an atheist. Um, one of my best friends, Chris Elric is a Buddhist. I have Jewish friends. like. I don't care what you believe, but find your people, right? Like, and, and I know that I'm not everyone's people. A friend of mine, Andrea Quinn calls this a good to know. So many of us, if you don't like me, if Bill here doesn't like me or if Pearl or Michael says, eh, she, eh you know, she wasn't that great. Um, and you gave me that feedback. Um, too many stories, I'm a storyteller, too many stories. You know, we want more tips. Um, and I'm not, someone doesn't like a storyteller. Um, in the old days, it would hurt my feelings, but Andrea Quinn helped me to say, well, that's just a good to know. You're never going to be everybody's people. So it's a good to know when everyone else was applying for PPP loans, all my body language expert friends, all applying for PPP loans. I was like, no, I remember a story of Rosie O'Donnell. So I used to do stand up comedy in New York City in my 20s. And I met Rosie O'Donnell and I and I I was interested in, in her story. And I remember watching an interview with Rosie O'Donnell where she everyone said that she needed a degree. You need to go get a college degree as a backup plan. And she goes, I don't want a backup plan. If you throw someone off the ship in the middle of the ocean and they have a life raft, they're not going to swim as fast to the, to the shore in as hard as they possibly can if they're holding onto a float or, or have, a, have a flotation device. Hmm. And she didn't want a backup. And, and I just, when the PPP loans came out, I'm like, if I, I believe, I ask God to be the CEO of my life. And when I'm asking God to be the CEO of my life, then I know everything's going to turn out okay. Like, um, so for me, it's just my, my belief in God. And so I called a very Christian, I was raised Catholic. I'm a non-denominational Christian now, but Kat, when I was raised Catholic, we don't really own a Bible, right? You don't own a Bible if you're Catholic. And if you do, you don't know where it is. You certainly don't have it here on your coffee table. Um, if you're a Catholic, I doubt you can hold up your Bible the way that I can. And uh, my non-denominational church, I take notes. I love it. I just, I just, I mean, and I call my super Christian friend, Dodo. She's my college roommate in North Carolina when I was suffering. And I go, I mean, I'm really struggling, you know? And, and she said, buy this book. It's called Two Chairs by Bob Bodine. Mm -hmm. And if you happen to be a Christian, um, the question, he asked three questions, this Bob Bodine. He says, um, does God know what's going on in your life? Yes. Is it too much for God to handle? No. Does God have a plan for your life? Yes. Um, do you know what God's plan is for today for you? No. Well, we pray, we ask for God for things, but we never listen. And so what I did during the pandemic, Bob, and, and it might not be for everybody, it's just my technique. And if I happen to be your people, then, then use this, right. is I set up a chair almost every day, not as often today. And I'd set up a chair and I'd ask God three questions. And, and then you have to listen. You ask one, two, three questions, that's it. And you stop and listen for God to answer. And so I said, what do you want me to see? What do you want me to hear, truly hear? And what do you want me to do today? Mm. And it got me through. And, and I got to tell you, so my car was repossessed. In order for me to get my car back, it was going to be $36,000. All my stuff is in the car. They towed it down to Richmond, Virginia. I'm in Alexandria. So it's like an hour and a half, two hours away. I'm mortified. You know, I'm in the shower. And my, my babysitter knocks on the door. I think someone stole your car. You know, I have three kids. You know, the year before, I made $780,000. And, and I, I don't have nothing. And guess what? Within 24 hours, I got my car back. I had a two chairs conversation with God. And I'm like, what do you want me to see? What do you want me to do? And, and I was like, I remember thinking, I'm going to go buy a used car. I'm going to buy a used car. I don't have this money to get this other vehicle back and my mini Honda minivan. I'm going to buy a used car. I'll be okay. 
And God told me in this conversation, and I was going that day with a friend of mine, he goes, don't go get a used car. I've got, I've got you. And my ex-husband called me, I think it was three o'clock, three something. And he said, you're not going to believe this, but the banking, the bank called and said, they made a mistake and we can go pick up the car tomorrow without paying. They made a mistake because they had given us an extension and no one recorded it. And so I didn't have to pay one penny to get my car back. And so for me, A, two chairs, and B, even if you're not Christian, there's a great thing that you can read out there, and it's by a woman named Florence, and it's called The, the, the Game of Life and How to Play It. And I do mind maps. I wish I had my mind map here. So my map has a center point and all these other sub points off it and helps me remember the content. So The Game of Life and How to Play It was written in the 1920s. And it's online if you go to YouTube for free. And it's Florence Scoville is her name. And you can hear, you, there's someone reading her book. And it's black and white. When you see it, there's a couple of versions. I, the black and white version, you'll see a picture of black and white, the game of life and how to play it. And it is on, it's about manifesting. It's all about manifesting and the game of life, how to play it, how you play it as you follow the rules of the Bible. And I'll give you this one little story that helped me through this time is there's these Kings, these three Kings, and they're traveling through the desert with their camels and some of their people and they're thirsty. They're wicked thirsty. And they pray, I think it's like the prophet Elijah or Eli, and they pray to this prophet and the prophet comes down in the desert and says, listen, plant, um, dig as many ditches as you can dig. God's going to fill them up with water. Well, there's not a cloud in the sky. There's not a cloud in the sky, but they start digging with their hands and they start digging as many ditches as they can in the desert. And they wake up the next morning and it's filled with water. So the moral of the story is if you want to change your circumstances right now, you need to see it, you need to believe it, and you need to act on it. And so one of my things is I want to own a house on a lake where I can wake up and the sun is out and it's a beautiful day, $2 million house. And I want to have a boat and some jet skis right there. I could see it from my dining room window, from my living room window. It's on a peninsula and it's gorgeous. And so I could see it. I believe I'm going to own, I'm going to own this house. And then I went to Home Depot and I bought myself a key. And the key says on the actual key, home. And I have it in my wallet. And uh, if we get a second at the end, I'll grab it and I'll show it to you wherever my wallet is. It's somewhere here and I'll show you my key. And so you've got to see it, you got to believe it, and then you've got to invest in it. You've got to act on it to believe that it's true. So call it manifesting, call it praying. Uh, I'm, a, I'm big on praying and manifesting, big. I say a manifestation prayer every single day and I'll send it to you if you you want to send it to your people and uh, it's uh, it's a, it's a game changer i say it every day a couple times a day so we can we can chat about that in the end if you want so that's how i did it is you have to see it believe it and then act on it even something small small investment like me buying that key to my house matter of fact i bought two keys and i gave one to my best friend and she's what's this i go i wanted to give you a key to my new two million dollar house on a peninsula on a lake so you can come anytime you want. She goes, really? When did you buy that? I go, let's not go over the details right now, but I've had it for a long time. Wait till you come and visit. And so she keeps my key to my house in her wallet. And I have no doubt in my mind, get back to me this time next year or in the next two years. And I'll be, I'll be interviewing you. You'll be interviewing me and I'll be showing you my jet skis <laughs> out it. the window. Awesome. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, yeah. yeah I, Oh, one more thing. I want to tell you something. So I, part of my manifesting is I say, I want to thank God for unexpected or the, or the universe, if you want to say, for unexpected wins, unexpected offers, unexpected generosity, unexpected prosperity from unexpected places in my life, from people I've never met from all areas of the world. And I kept saying, thank you, God. Thank you for bringing these unexpected people and unexpected offers in my life. And I got three different emails that kept saying, Two were emails and one was social media. And it said, Janine, I think we could turn your training into make you millions of dollars on online training. Please get in touch with me, Jesse Itzler. And I'm like, delete, scam, scam, make my train, turn my training into online training, delete, delete. And then finally I get this email and it says, Janine, I am trying to reach you. My name is Jesse Itzler. I just want, I've done four TED Talks. I've just watched your TED Talk, how five words can get you what you want. I loved it. I'd love to set up a time to call to talk to you. Now, a friend of mine who goes, in, he's a therapist that goes into and works with violent felons in jails, murderers. His name is Christian Conte. And if you haven't had him on, Bob, Dr. Christian Conte, he's a, he's, it's a game changer. He's amazing. He talks about anger and a bunch of stuff. He says, it's very easy for us to say to people in jail, listen, 
when you get out of jail, stop doing drugs, stop making bad decisions. It's like climbing up the mountain and screaming down, Bob, come on up. It's really easy. Come on up, come on up the mountain. He, the recidivism rate in our country, which means people returning to jail is through the roof, right? It really jail. Do you know what it is? I, I had a, a convicted felon tell me two months ago. He said, jail is a career fair for criminals because they go in and they're learning all about how to not get caught next time in the next scam. So what Christian Conte says is climb down the mountain and meet people where they're at. Come with me, come with me, I'll show you the way. Climb back down the mountain and this Jesse Itzler character, when he said, I saw your TED talk and I loved it, A, he stroked my ego. And we all wanna feel like we matter and belong. Yeah. I say, when we feel like we matter and belong, cooperation will be strong. If you want to get something from someone, make them feel that they matter and belong. And so that's number one. And number two, he climbed down the mountain and met me where I was at. I talked to him. He looks like a homeless guy. He's got like crazy beard. Do you know who Jesse Itzler is? I don't. I don't. But I want to meet him. Yeah, me neither. So I'm like, he goes, what do you know about me, Janine? I go, honestly, nothing. Not evidently you're going to turn me into a millionaire. He goes, well, I used to be the manager for Run DMC. I was a professional rapper. I um, had a uh, private airline where you could buy airline tickets and take private flights. I sold it to a guy named Warren Buffett for millions of dollars. I imported, I was the first person to import coconut water. I sold it to a company called Coca-Cola and my wife invented Spanx. And I go, what? What did you say? And he goes, and my wife invented Spanx. I go, yeah, right. If your wife invented Spanx, what's her name? And he said, Sarah Blakely. And I was like, ah, uh, okay, Jesse, it's Lair has now got my attention. Out comes the steeple that I did behind Colleen decades earlier. I'm like, now, Jesse, tell me more about this. Well, Jesse Itzler and I are now friends. He's going to give me a radio show. He just, he just got his own radio station. So I'm going to have a podcast on his radio station. I've already been, he has a program called 30 Days of Excellence. I've already gone as, on as a speaker and he's already changed my life, life. And from the moment that I read the book, Two Chairs, 12 months from that point, I will make more money in that 12 month period than I've ever made traveling the world, being away from my kids, sometimes 17 days in a row once, 17 days away. My youngest son is six, my oldest is 15. Here I am at home in the comfort of my house, you know, sitting right here in my kitchen, in my dining room, right here, my little fake fireplace. Wow, beautiful. beautiful. Talking to you. And so it's, um, I really, you got to see it, believe it, and then act on it. And so I believe in, I truly do that. I know people talk about it. It really works. <laughs> but it works. You know, I think a lot of times what they keep forgetting though is that last part, that acting on it. And yes. the fact that you took that step and the fact that you have acted on it. You know, um, you know, when I'm- I'm listening, but I'm, gonna, I'm trying to find, I wanna find my key for you because I wanna dine to show you this. Yeah. When people say, um, you know, Bob, what, what's your profession? And I say, I'm human behaviors. Automatically their behavior changes. Right? Yes. All I have to say is on the human behaviors, whether I'm a psychologist, psychologist is, is irrelevant. Human behavior, and they immediately their behavior starts to change. What happens when you tell somebody that you're a body language expert, or that you work for the ATF, or you know whatever? What, what happens? How do they respond? Well, everyone wants to. I you know surprisingly, I would say nine times out of ten, people want to lie to me and see if I can catch them. And so I remember one time in, at New Year's Eve, uh, I was married at the time and uh, my ex-husband, he, he wore a um, kilt. He's a kilt guy, right? Scottish, we have Scottish, Scottish and Irish heritage. He's Scottish. So he's wearing this kilt and this guy who's like a, uh, like a famous person on TV. I don't watch live TV, but I guess he's some famous newsman in the DC area. And he's there with his girlfriend that's like a third of his age. And he goes, ask me anything, ask me anything. See if you could tell if I'm lying ask me anything. It's a New Year's Eve party, thousands of people in DC. And I go, have you ever cheated on your girlfriend? And he's like, uh, um, we, we, um, we, we don't have an exclusive agreement. And uh, she goes, excuse me? What do, you, what do you mean we don't? What do you mean we don't have an exclusive agreement? And he's like, well, you know, like when I travel, she goes, what do you mean when you travel? I so badly wanted to say, bring out the steeple sister. So um, they, they end up get, breaking up. As a matter of fact, she gets drunk and asks me if I want to go back into her room. She's like, hey, I like you. Do you want to go upstairs? I'm like, oh, this is getting awkward. I'm like, I just want to be here with my guy in a guilt, you know? And my husband goes, really? You had to go there? You had to destroy your New Year's Eve, Janine. You had to destroy the relationship. I go, hey, he played the game. One time I was in Seattle and it was a radio show in Seattle, like a Kiss 108 FM kind of more. I'm that kind of a guest, a morning show guest, you know, morning drive guest. 
And the guy, the DJ, who was like super famous in Seattle goes, um, Janine, see if you could tell if I'm lying, ask me anything. And I go, have you ever cheated on your wife? And he goes, um, have I ever cheated on my wife? I go, that's a stalling technique. You're repeating the question. Have you ever cheated on my wife? And he's like, why would I ever, why would I cheat on my wife? I go, mm. most people who are lying will say, why would I ever do that? I'd have to be stupid to do something like that. Are you calling me a cheater? What kind of person do you think I am? I go so far, you're, you're, you've got two strikes out. Have you ever cheated on your wife? And he goes, I did four years ago. And she found out and um, I have not cheated ever since. Mm. And it got really heavy and dark. And when I was being escorted out of the building by like Wonder Boy, like whatever the sidekicks are called, they said, hands down the best show we ever had. And you'll never be invited back. We all suspected that he got, got busted cheating because all of a sudden the wife started coming around about four years ago and would always call and ask where he was. So it's not, uh, you know, I did stand up comedy in my 20s and opened up for Chris Rock and Robin Williams and Ray Romano. And when people find out I did stand, I'm a Gemini. So I'm, a, I'm also a licensed massage therapist. Like I'm a little bit of everything, you know, I've like lived lives of 10 people. When I tell people I do stand up, they're like, tell me a joke, mm. tell me a joke. But when I say I'm a human behavior, I say, you know, I, I teach people how to, to, you know, influence human behavior. Mm -hmm. And read and influence human behavior, they'll always say, you know, or I'm a detecting deception, deception expert, a human lie detector. Let me, t let me, I'll tell you, ask me anything and see if I, if you can bust me. I go right for the jugular, Bob. I I'm going right for the cheating. I love hey, look, it. Look, I brought for us to show you. Oh, this. very cool. Okay, so I bought two of these. As a matter of fact, the people at Home Depot said, would you like me to engrave the key? I go, oh, I'm busy. I'll have to come back and engrave it. So you can see there's no grooves on it. That is there's no grooves yet. That is awesome. So that's the key. The key yeah. to manifesting is you got to see it, believe it, and then act on it. And there's a great, I don't, I have it here somewhere. I can't find it, but there's a great TED talk out there. Um, and it's all about, um, oh my gosh, I'll have to tell you, I'll have to, I'll have to find it and give it to you um, to give to all of your people. But mm -hmm. it's, it's, you write your life right now in black and white, you draw a picture, drawings. And on the other side, you put it all in color, the kind of life that you want. And you got to see it, believe it and act on it. And so um, it's really good. And I can't remember her name right now, but I'll find it out, out for you. But I did that too during COVID. I just surrounded myself with positivity. That's awesome. That's awesome. What, it's um, you know, you've seen the shows like Lie to Me and all these different shows, right? What are some of the misconceptions that people have about um, about lie deception and, and that whole process? Well, first of all, I'm trained by the real guy that that movie is uh, based on. Dr. Paul Ekman is one of the people I've been personally trained by. Yes, as a matter of fact, I was trained. Uh, we were in a hotel in um, either, I think it was like New Jersey or upstate New York. And he was teaching me the difference between fear and surprise because the, there's seven universal emotions that show up on our face the same way. Happiness, sadness, fear, surprise, anger, contempt, and disgust. And the ones I was having trouble with were surprise and fear. And so surprise, the eyebrows go up and in curved. In fear, the eyebrows go up and they're straight across. In, but the mouth opens in both. But in surprise, the mouth opens and it's relaxed. In fear, the mouth opens and it's taut right, and pulls back in, in a micro expression, which is a 25th of a second, it was hard for me to, to know is that surprise or fear. And it's, and it's a game changer, it matters. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm police and I knock on your door and you show me fear, um, that's different than if you show me surprise, right? Mm -hmm. uh, why? Because fear is, is everyone okay? You know, surprise is you busted me right? By the way, surprise is the quickest of all the emotions and it's a catalyst for other emotions. So if you throw a surprise party for someone, Bob, and they come in and they're like, oh, <laughs> I can't believe this is a surprise party. And their eyebrows stay up for more than two seconds. Someone totally told them there was a surprise party. That's why they're all dolled up and their hair is all fixed up and they've got fancy lipstick on and their fake nails. Someone told them because surprise is the quickest. It's a fleeting emotion and surprise. I come at you with a knife. It goes from surprise to fear. I throw you a surprise party from surprise to happiness or surprise to sadness. Um, so so that that's a sidebar on, sorry, my hair's like driving me nuts here. Um, that's a sidebar on being trained by Dr. Paul Ekman and his work was trained, um, was used in that show, Lie to Me. As, as far as, a, as a, a myth about body language, the biggest one is crossed arms. This is huge because what, what do most people think, Bob? 
And everyone at home, I would say you can't unhear, unexperience what we're talking about or unsee it. So cross your arms and feel it. So when someone crosses their arms in a, you know, whether it's the bar room, the boardroom, or even the bedroom, what message am I sending? Closed off is what we would normally think. Right, closed off, bored, disinterested, defensive. Right. Um, yes, it could be those things, but it's the biggest myth because it's not always that. As a matter of fact, because the right brain, which is intuitive and likes to take risks, controls the left side of my body and the left brain that likes facts and figures and logic and wants to think about it controls the right side of my body. When I cross my arms, Bob, I'm using both sides of my brain. A study was done that indicates you're 30% more likely to solve a difficult task or problem with crossed arms because you are engaging both parts of your brain. You were asked to answer math questions and at the end of every math question, you're asked, Bob, to just relax your hands and then look at the next question and do it and relax your hands. The other group is asked, answer a math question, then cross your arms. The people with crossed mm -hmm. arms stayed in the room doing the test 30% longer than the people that gave up. So if you ever look at like cops, I'm, so I'm from law enforcement originally, I teach corporate America today. This, I say, if I could teach the CIA to get to the truth, I can help you sell anything, right? Yeah. So I say, I had to sell jail for a living. That's <laughs> the hardest product to sell, to get you by telling me the truth, not a confession. Anyone can get a confession. I don't want the confession. I want the truth. What is the truth? Yeah. And um, if you just simply look at any of these crime shows, they'll put the cold case evidence here and they bring out the folders and then they lean back and what do they do? They cross their arms. You yourself, listening at home, I guarantee you when you're trying to solve a difficult problem, you're gonna think about it with your crossed arms. You're using both sides of your brain, it happens all the time. And, but it gets a really bad, it gets a bad name for itself, this crossed arm. So when I'm doing my live events, hopefully 2021 at some point or 2022, and I see someone with crossed arms, I go, well, that person may not like me, but they're not going anywhere. Mm. They're 30% more likely to stay in that room. Yeah. That's incredible. I love, I love the way that you're explaining it too, because I think a lot of times we just, we get these pat answers given to us by experts um, and they're mm. experts that typically haven't, uh, really done the experiential part of it. They've just read the mm -hmm. textbook part of it. And uh, so the things that you're sharing are really, really powerful. What do you think has been, you know, I want to go back to this two chair, the Bob Odin thing. I, I love that mm. story. What, what do you think is one of the most powerful um, answers that you were given by God in a, in a two chair experience? Oh my gosh. It's um, oh, so many. I, I mean, you know, I, so, so I took, I, I, this is, I took notes on it, you know, oh, Isaiah 54, seven, nothing can defeat you because God is with you. Is it too hard for him to handle? No, trust in the Lord with all your heart and learn uh, not onto your own understanding and all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. You know, I'm going through a divorce right now and it's tough because it's 17 years. We get along really great. I knew I wasn't supposed to marry this man. I called the wedding off three times. He, he just wasn't my people and and I like him and he's nice, but I say we're two ping pong balls kind of bouncing around in this house right here. We never connected. And so I'm four weeks out from getting the final divorce. I just filed all the paperwork and in the state of Virginia, if you have kids, you have to be separated for a year. And I didn't date in that year, but I'm gearing up, you know, I'm ready to date. And so I asked God, I said, God, not only do I want you to be the CEO of my life, I'd like you to write my new love story. I tried to write the first love story and I, it didn't, it wasn't the right one. So I want you to write my love story. And there's a great way to figure out if God's involved. If, if for me, with, my, with romance, if I'm meeting someone, because I'm talking to a couple of people, and if I'm left confused or uncertain, I know that God's not involved. But if when I'm talking to that person and I'm communicating and there's peace and calm, then I know that God's hand is likely touching that in some way. Yeah. This is very interesting. This Rob guy that I was telling you about last night, um, my picture of my mother up here, which I'm, we're, we're walking, we're walking, we're walking, we're walking. I love so, your let me see. humor. Oh, thank you. Let's see. I got to find it. I'm, I'm getting my, my house is being painted here. Oh man, I can't see it. It, my house is being painted. So I don't know where it moved to. Hold on. Let's check here. And then I want to paint really quick. Let me see if mom is in here. No. So I don't know, my, my, my office is being painted. But um, I took this picture of my mother's face, right? And I drew a heart around it. This was yesterday. I drew a heart around it. And I go, mom, 
if this Rob from high school is someone that you want me to be with, send me a sign. And if it's not him, send me a sign. And I just took my hand around this 11 by 14 and put a heart around my mother, right? And guess what happens? I ended up talking to Rob last night. We talked for three hours and 21 minutes. As we go to say goodbye, it's 3.21 a.m. So I took a screenshot of 3.21 a.m. And I couldn't believe it, right? So I'm like, this is unbelievable that we, here we are, we talk to three hours and 21 minutes. And then uh, on top of it, look at this, 321. Okay, I don't know if you can see right there. That's the time. And then I talked for three, three, 321. Do you want to know what my mother's birthday is? What do you think my mother's birthday was? March 21st. March 21st. Wow. Isn't that crazy? This is last night. Crazy. This is real. This is not just a story that I'm yeah. that makes it sound really cool. I mean, this is this just happened and it didn't even dawn on me. I call my best friend from New York and I go, guess what? I talked to Rob Fitzgerald for three hours, 21 minutes last night. And as we're hanging up, I looked at the time and it was 321. 321 must be our lucky number. And she goes, that's funny because March 21st is coming up. And I was like, oh, and I burst out crying. Mm. I go, March 21st is my mother's birthday. I just wrote a heart around her face. It's just, all right. So I don't, I could go on and on and on. So Bob Bodine, I, you know, I'll tell you one thing that, but that I, in two chairs that happened, mm. that I think is a game changer for me and maybe for you at home, is when I ask God to, to, in two chairs, you know, tell me what you want me to see, what you want me to hear, what you want me to do. Uh, one time I was like, oh, I'm sitting there and I'm just trying to hear him. And, uh, and, and I go, oh, do you want me to spend extra attention with Jack today? My, my little, my, three, my six-year-old. I go, do you want me to spend extra time with Jack? And God said, no, that's still you talking, Janine. That's not me. That's, that's still you, gift again. And I go, okay, okay, awkward. And so I, I just stopped and I listened. And he told me to pay attention to patterns. So the computer here is sitting on this thing. And, and I just started noticing patterns. And, and God just said, I want you to notice patterns. And so anywhere I looked, I looked at a pattern on a pillow or a pattern on a scarf. And I just started looking at patterns. And I have no, it's kind of like the karate kid. You know, I go, okay, I'm looking at, I guess I'm looking at patterns, right? And when I took a shower at my office, I have an office, it's like an apartment building. And I took a shower and I just started looking at the patterns of the tile. And I looked at the patterns on the shampoo bottle. And I, I just started looking at the patterns. And all of a sudden, God said to me, see, people are involved with all this, like these patterns, like you're never alone. And then it just dawned on me, someone had to decide what size hole the, the, the shampoo bottle would, what's the perfect amount of shampoo to come out of the hole. Someone had to decide what, it, you know, to call it shampoo. Someone had to create the English language or letters and someone had to decide what, what it would smell like and what it would look like. And someone had to, to operate a machine and someone else had to put it in a box and take it on a bus and, or a truck and take it off a truck. And then someone had to come up with marketing. And then all those people have family and all those families have family and they have kids. And suddenly here where I'm going through a divorce, and feeling broken and suffering with COVID and all this sad stuff, all of a sudden, just by simply looking at patterns, I no longer felt alone. Mm -hmm. I felt so connected to so many people that I'll never ever meet. But I was standing, by the way, naked in a shower, feeling like mm, a little awkward. Like all of a sudden I'm in there with thousands of people. I'm like, can we wrap it up? I got the message, God. Uh, I remember I was staying at a Western hotel once in a presidential suite. It was a mistake, I think. The client put me in there, but I, I received it. Women are meant to receive. Men are made to protect and serve. Story for another time, in my opinion. So I'm in this hotel and I say to the room service, I go, this, this room has a, a piano. It has a dining room table. Like... This is fancy. She was at the West End. It was like the top quarter of the hotel. I go, has anyone famous stayed here? And the woman said, yeah, Richard Gere was there two weeks ago. And I was like, oh, I'm sleeping naked in bed tonight. <laughs> Let's talk about taking it to the next level. And, I'm, and then I'm like, and when I'm in the shower, I'm like imagining being with Richard Gere for that hot second. And no sooner did the fantasy hit my brain, did she then say, and Hillary Clinton was there last week. Now, whether you like Hillary Clinton or not, that's great. You don't want to be naked in a bed with Hillary Clinton and Richard Gere. Like it just destroyed the fantasy in a blink of an eye. So I have a thing evidently about showers. Yeah. There's something about, because then when I was taking the shower, I was like imagining being with Hillary Clinton and Richard Gere. Mm. But God talks to me a lot. 
and uh, I just I just receive it. And so Bob Bodine's book is a, is a for me it is a game. I want to meet him. It's a game changer. Yeah. Uh, and constant. I mean, I took a ton of notes. He quotes movies, and so mm -hmm. check it out. Um, two chairs, and and I've had tons of people that then um, had their bought it for family members. Mm -hmm. Bob Bodine. It looks like that. Um, it's red. Mm -hmm. and it just says two chairs. But let me see. I'm gonna see if I dog eared anything here. If I start it. Um, but you can ask me any questions. Okay. I know so, we're kind of yeah, we're going to open it up for questions here in a, in a few in a few minutes. So yeah. guys, get you ready. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and raise your hand, and uh, so we can call on you. But uh, in in the meantime, um, while you're doing that, what are some some telltale signs when somebody is not being truthful with you uh, in a business or a personal relationship? What are some telltale signs? So my. Uh, the big one is a shoulder shrug. So a shoulder shrug means uncertainty. Um, what do you want for lunch? A salad, a BLT? I don't know. What do you want? It makes sense, right? So it's congruent because verbally you're saying, I don't know, and non-verbally you're, you're shrugging. But now everyone just shrug. And at the same time, you're shrugging saying, I'm so glad I'm here today. Mm. I'm so glad I'm here today. Mm. I like your haircut. I love that beard. Yeah, I'm doing great. So anytime you're making a, giving a definitive answer and there's a shrug, then that means there's uncertainty and that means there's a disconnect. So it doesn't mean they're lying. So body language does not tell you the catalyst behind it. So you have to become an investigator. And I always say, you know, soften your voice, be kind, not nasty and judgmental. And don't tell them you see the shrug, just say this, maybe I'm wrong here, but it, it feels to me, or it seems to me, or it sounds to me, whichever one, don't say all three. Um, there's something you're uncertain about. And then you wait, I call it W-A-I-T, why am I talking? So I, that's the big one. Another one, I'll give you two more. So another one is pull your lips in. When we don't like what we see or hear, our lips disappear. And so people will suppress their lips. It could be anger if you also see the brows coming down or they're crossing their arms and they're grabbing onto their arms with some increase in pressure, but it could be just their lips disappear. So uh, this happens a lot. Um, Jesse Smollett staged just a hate crime in, in, in Chicago a year or two ago. And um, when talking about the story, lips disappear. Britney Spears said her marriage wasn't falling apart. You know, she's pregnant with her second kid being interviewed by Matt Lauer and uh, her lips disappear. Two weeks later, she files for divorce. So when we don't like what we see or hear, our lips disappear. It means they're holding something back. And again, we don't, it might not be anything bad. You know, it could be something good. They may be thinking, I should have came with you guys two years ago. I should have hired you four years ago. I'd be in a much better place. So we just don't know what the catalyst is. And the last one that no one's ever taught us, and I don't understand this, Bob, why we're not teaching this to the younger generation is there's the body language gesture that turns agreement to disagreement. And it's so easy and no one's ever taught us. What do you think it is? So I'm saying, yes, I'm nodding my head. Yes. I go, Bob. Yes. I'd love to come back. Let's do part two. Yes. Have me back. Yes. 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 I'm saying, yes. I'm nodding my head. Yes. What do you think the hand gesture is that turns agreement to disagreement? Hmm. It's not the middle finger, which an audience <laughs> member screamed out. Although that one also would likely yes. indicate. <laughs> Yeah, that might do it. It's it's anytime we pacify our face. So our brain, a pacifier is anytime a piece of our body touches another piece of our body. So everyone right now, just hold your wrist and say, and rub your wrist with your other hand and just say, who's on the phone? So everyone give this a shot. Bob, you do it with me. So okay. rub your wrist, please indulge me. Say, who's on the phone, Janine? Who's on the phone, Janine? Now rub your arm, upper arm. Who's on the phone, Janine? Now rub your throat. Who's on the phone, Janine? Rub the, the back of your neck. Who's on the phone, Janine? Now phone. your forehead. Who's on the phone, Janine? Who's on the phone, Janine? Who stresses you out the most? Hmm. This one. <laughs> the higher this pacifier, the more stress and anxiety. Why? Because our head is in here. So if someone is saying yes to something and they're agreeing, men tend to pat their back of their head like this. So they'll be in a meeting with you and they'll go, yeah, yeah, we're going to move. Send me the contract. Yeah, we'll move forward. They're telling you, if I call it a nonverbal objection, they're telling you there's something before you go write up this contract and, and plan your Aruba vacation, uh, you want to make sure you're going to solve the problems because just because you have a contract and someone verbally says yes doesn't mean they sign on the dotted line, right? Mm. So 
this is a pacifier. Women, we tend to, in these moments, we'll say, yeah, that sounds good. Yep, count me in. We'll lift from the nape of our neck up. We'll lift our hair from the nape, the back of our neck on up. Uh huh. Yeah, I would love to work on this project. Yes, yes, I'd love to babysit your dogs while you go to Disney World for two weeks. <laughs> yes, oh yes, I would love to do that. Um, another one is that men do is they'll ventilate and so they'll use their hand like a comb. Women tend to not do this because they might have product in their hand. I don't, my hand is a disaster. So right here, um, they'll ventilate and they'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anytime though, now I'm gonna fix this. I don't even know what's happening now. So um, anytime you're touching your um, face or your neck or you're doing these like pacifying gestures, right? Um, you're saying there's a problem here. So it turns agreement to disagreement. And I'll give you a bonus one too, that this is a big one for me. In 2020, I started doing something that I want everyone to write down. And I'm carrying it into 2021 because it's it's making me a lot more successful and it will for you too, mm -hmm. uh, uh, is be interested, not interesting. So Harvard Business Review talked about a big study and the study proved that when we meet you for the first time, people meet you for the first time, they're asking two questions. They're asking, can I respect you and can I trust you? Mm -hmm. Now, respect is connected to competence and many of us lead with this. We lead with solving your problems. We lead with my resume. You know, I'm the first New York Times bestselling author I ever met. It's me, right? I've written this book. So it's translated in X amount of languages. I do this, I do whatever. They, they sing their praises, right? This is, you should respect me. But the first question they're actually asking is, can I trust you? And trust is connected to warmth and likability. And one of the ways to be warm and likable is to be interested, not interesting. When you are interesting, you're in your left brain space solving people's problems. When you're interested, you're in the right brain space sitting with people, listening to people. Mm. So I remind myself, Janine, because I have the gift to gab, uh, I remind myself, be interested, not interesting. And I do some exercises with my clients and my group. And in the long story short is you ask people, hey, what's going on for you these days? And Bob says, I'm buying a new house. Re you repeat what Bob is saying. I, it's called first echo, second echo, third echo. Oh, you're buying a new house. Anything else going on for you? Because we want to jump right in, right? To that first scenario, but we want to peel the layers down. Uh, a, a friend of mine was applying for a job at a three-letter television agency, ABC, NBC, CBS, one of those. <laughs> And she was talking to the CEO, like the big boss, right? And, she, and I said, how are you gonna, she had a call, a five minute call schedule. Big deal, right? A friend hooked her up. And I go, what are you, how are you gonna start it? She goes, oh, I'm gonna tell them that I traveled with six sec secretaries of state, um, Condoleezza Rice's and my cell phone, blah, blah, blah. I go, that's leading with you should respect me, that you're competent. And she already knows that or she wouldn't be giving you a five minute phone call. You need to lead with being warm and likable. So you need to ask her questions, repeat them get stack it, go three to four levels deep. And then you say, is there anything I can do to help? Is there anything I can do to help with any of these issues that we just talked about? And so guess what? That five minute, she didn't want to do it. I made her do it. And that five minute phone call turned into a 35 minute phone call with the CEO, 35 minutes. So a body language tell that says you're talking too much is if you are in a meeting and you could see them even on Zoom here or in person and they scratch their nose with the index finger, okay? Powerful people will often do this. They're not gonna do the big pacifiers by grabbing their throat. Anyone, by the way, anytime someone's pacifying on their face suddenly at some point in the meeting, I want you to stop because you can't unsee it and, and check, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Are you being interested? Are you being interesting? Be interested. So a powerful people that will scratch their nose like this. And I, I went to a breakfast with a, a senior vice president at Comcast NBC Universal. So Comcast is a client. This woman named Mika Brzezinski, she has a, a show with her husband, Joe Scarborough. It's called The Morning Joe. And she does an event called Know Your Value. It's a woman's event. And so she has me speak. I'm the only nobody. Nobody knows who I am. And there's other famous people, right? Sarah Jessica Parker, Bobby Brown, the makeup artist, Martha Stewart, and then Jeannie Driver, you know, the chunky girl coming in from the back of the room, right? No one knows who I am. And, uh, but she digs that I know my value, right? And uh, so uh, an executive who was there from LA asked me to go to breakfast, right? And he came with his partner and we're eating at breakfast and I'm talking and all this, his name's Lee Strauss. He doesn't work there anymore. And Lee Strauss starts doing this. And I'm like, abort, abort, danger, danger, Dean, stop talking, stop being interested immediately. You must stop yeah, being interesting. And so I said, you know what, enough about me, Lee, what's it like to negotiate the deal for Kelly Clarkson show or The Voice or 
all these show that is, shows that, and you know, who, who's nice on The Voice? Is Blake Shelton nice? You know, it's Kelly Clarkson. And I just start getting him talking. Guess what? Seven days later, the following week, he hops back on a plane from LA into DC and he's in my office sleeping over. I have two bedrooms in my office space up the street. He sleeps over and I'm helping him write a book proposal on how to write negotiations because he always wanted to write a book. So now Lee Strauss is my friend. He no longer is at NBC. He's writing this huge book. He's getting this huge book deal. And I swear, it's the power of knowing what to look for, right? This, this facial touch, this pacifier happens to be with the index finger because he's powerful me going back to this core belief in 2020 and 2021 be interested not interesting warmth and likability is connected with trust competence is connected with you should respect me and how I wrap it all up in a bow for us is I want you to think of the cavemen so if I have Flo here comes to town and she's a cave woman and I'm a cave woman with my ex cave husband and my two three three cave children boys and she comes to town am I saying to myself first can she light a good fire or am I saying, when we fall asleep tonight, is she going to steal my husband and kill me and the kids? She could take the ex-husband, just leave me and the kids alone. First, we're saying, am I safe? Is she going to kill us? Then I'm saying, can she light a good fire? And I think it's a good lesson for all of us to learn is, are you leading with you should respect me? That's your bio. That's your left brain. That's solving problems. Check out a guy out there, really great, a whole bunch of free stuff on YouTube about um, name it to tame it. His name is um, Dr. Um, it's going to come to me. So I don't know if you have any questions, but I'm going to, I'm going to look this up really quick. Okay, Name well, I, know, I know Flo has a question, but I'll, I'll wait for her to come on. And then uh, Bill always has a good question. Uh, let's Dan see. Siegel, S-I-E-G-E-L, Dan Siegel, Name It to Tame It. And he talks all about right brain and left brain so you can understand what's happening in our brain. Awesome. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you. you know, one, thank you for all those great resources. I mean, I'll go back and watch the video and, and write it all down, but I know some of the people are already writing them down. I can see the, the comments. So uh, yeah, these but, are just resources I use. Uh, yeah. the, the number one resource, if you don't have it, is, is uh, this one. If, you, if you're a Christian, at least, even yeah. if you're not a Christian, you could just call it good reading. There's still some <laughs> cool lessons you might learn in here. Right. Agreed. Agreed. So uh, Flo, you want to come on and, and ask your question? Oh, I thought you were going to do Bill first. Okay. Um, Janine, oh my gosh, I just, I love you. And thank you so much for sharing. Um, one of my favorite shows was Lie to Me, the show. <laughs> um, how long did that take you to learn? I'm still learning it. Mm. I'm still constantly learning it. Um, Good answer. Yeah, I am. It's true. There, uh, I... I've got to tell you, unlike the academic world, I was going to get my master's degree and I saw that it's very cutthroat. I had no idea like this um, academic world because I, <laughs> I wanted to be the first doctor, like doctor driver in my family. I remember I had an OBGYN visit and my doctor's amazing, Dr. Armstrong. And he goes, Janine, how's it going? I go, I'm a little stressed, Dr. Armstrong. And he goes, why? I go, well, I'm, I'm going to get my master's degree and you know, industrial psychology. And he's like, why are you doing that? I go, oh, then I want to get my doctorate. He goes, why do you want to get your doctorate? And I go, so one day on my tombstone, it says, here lays Dr. Janine Driver. He goes, how about this? How about you quit your master's degree? And I'll make sure when you die that someone puts on your tombstone, here lies Dr. Janine Driver. No one will know the difference. And you go live your life. I quit the school next, the next day oh. after six months in. Just quit it. I was halfway done with this 42 page paper I had to type. I wrote in and I was like, yeah, I'm done. I'm done. I guess I found out the solution. It's just gonna be like, here lays Dr. Janine Driver, you know, PhD. You know, so um, the reason I tell you that is in, in my world, the human behavior and Bob can can probably testify to this as well is in the world of human development and body language and reading people, I find and, and I'm wondering if Bob would agree that um, it's not very cutthroat. It's very nurturing. And you can see I'm, I'm telling you other resources. Mark McGlish is out there. He talks about the power of statement analysis, hidden words. Words have hidden meaning. As a matter of fact, words are way more important than detect the deception. 85% more likely to get, catch a liar with the words they're using way, than body language. Body language are flipping a quarter. You just are spotting stress and anxiety, not deception. So it's really hard mm. with body language. So Mark McGlish statement analysis. I'll give you a quick word if you want, Flo, that has a hidden meaning. Um, Joe Navarro, retired FBI agent. I'm learning from Joe all the time. And one of my books, You Can't Lie to Me, I've written two, uh, is he, he, I sent it to him and he gave me harsh feedback. And 
I took his feedback and it's a game changer for me. And he's written a ton of books. Amazing. He even has a book called the body language dictionary that came out in like 2018, 2019 game changer. As a matter of fact, I have it on my phone. And if I go on TV and I see something and I'm like, oh, I kind of forget what this is. I go right to Joe Navarro's body language dictionary book. So I find us to be very supportive in this, in this world. I love it. I, I, uh, I just love what I do. I, you know, I, Simon Sinek says, if you work hard and you don't like what you do, it's called stress. And if you work hard and you love what you do, it's called passion. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I love it. I'll give you this secret word. Do you want to know the word? Yes. yes. So there's a ton, by the way. Um, one <laughs> is the word left. So if I said to Bill right here, uh, Jane, Sh Jane Shack, if I said, Bill, uh, I call him up and I go, Bill, I just left my house. I'll meet you there at the restaurant on time. Right. Well, how is that different? I just left my house. I'll be there on time to meet you versus, hey, Bill, I, I'm going to be there on time. I'm 10 minutes out. I'll be there on time. I can't wait to see you. What's the difference between the statements? Which one do you know? Which one's screaming a problem? I just left. OK, what's the problem with that? What, why? What, what's the problem? Because they probably haven't left yet. <laughs> So most people will say that, right? The person's either being, so they're either be, being passive aggressive. Like I left, have you left? Are you on your way? Like they could be passive aggressive or they didn't really leave. So in my world, it's called um, offering evidence before it's asked. It's like the person says, I just want to let you know, I would never cheat on you. And you're on a first date. I want to say, oh my God, that's so interesting, Michael, because I'm not the kind of girl, if you don't call me back, that's going to key your car like a Carrie Underwood song. Anyway, what do they have here at the Outback Steakhouse? What is it? I'm assuming steak. <laughs> right? Nixon said, I'm not a crook. Nixon said, I'm not a crook. We say who we are. We are. We don't say who we're not. I said, I'm a swearing Christian. I don't say, hey, everyone, I just want you to let you know I'm not a Buddhist. I tell you, I'm the mother of three sons. I don't say, hi, everyone. I just want to let you know I'm not the mother of six daughters. So when people tell you who they are not, they are telling you who they really are. They're mm -hmm. offering evidence before it's asked. So when I say, I just left, I'll be there on time. The word I want you to focus on here is left. I left my job. I left my husband. Left indicates strife. So if you're going to a meeting and someone says, I just left the office, they're telling you there was some type of problem at the office. There was some kind of strife. And when you know this information, you can become better armed to be a better negotiator and better at reading and influencing human behavior because you would just simply say, Bob, is this still a good day? Is it still a good day? You wanna postpone, you wanna push it back? Because I may not wanna drop my product on Bob today when I now know there's some type of strife happening because he said the word left. Mm -hmm. This happens in law enforcement all the time. Wife goes missing and, and they interview the husband and he's like, well, I had a cocktail with her on the top of the, the roof and then I left her up there talking on their cell phone and then I never saw her again. Immediately police know to ask, were you and your wife arguing? Was there some type of problem? And when the man says, no, the police now know he's a liar. You're better to say, yeah, we were arguing because we know with the word left there's strife. And so when you say there's no problem, we know that if you're lying about this, what else might you be lying about? So it's a good opportunity when you hear someone say left to ask questions. Mm. Ah. Very good. Thank you. Statement analysis. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Bill, are you there? I know Bill might have been. I think he's home. I am home. There you are. Oh, it says unable to start video. Hold oh, on. Oh man. Let me let me click this. Should be. Start it. Uh, how about. Well, ugly. So you may not want to. <laughs> uh, it says. There you go. Hi, Maybe. Bill. How are you doing? Um, first Dad, of all, that, um, very interesting, very good. Uh, the Thank two you. things that stuck out with me is one, it, I thought of Bob because right when you were talking in the beginning, I'm going, oh, there's some boundaries that Bob's going to fall in love with. <laughs> and um, the second thing that popped out to me was your references to uh, Joseph Campbell. How, how's, yes. how'd you come to be a Campbell fan? Because I'm a huge Campbell fan. Oh my gosh, Finding Joe. So have you seen Finding Joe? Yeah. Yes. So I've seen it a hundred times and by a hundred times, I probably mean 104 times. <laughs> uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how, I don't know how Finding Joe was introduced to me, the documentary. I'd never heard of Joseph Campbell and, and I, I watched Finding Joe and it was just a game changer for me. And I love, 
you know, change the way you look at things, the things you look at change, right? Dr. Wayne Dyer. And my mother was listening to Dr. Wayne Dyer when I was a newborn baby under the tree out in the backyard. And the tree was like a mobile for me. And I'd watch the, the leaves dancing in the wind and they would put me to sleep. And uh, I don't know how I was introduced to Finding Joe, which is, if you've not seen it, it is a game changer. And it's about, you know, Joseph Campbell who traveled the world and this great philosopher and, and looked at all these stories we have in common, right? Like Luke is about to kill Darth Vader. And what happens? Darth Vader's like, dude, I'm your dad. <laughs> I'm your dad, dude. I'm your dad. Come on, right? And he's like, ah. Oh. And you see Luke is like, do I fall into this bottomless pit? Like, what do I do? Like, no, no. Right? You could like be in his head. Um, just when life is great, all of a sudden, you know, my mother died at, at breast cancer at 66. And if you had asked her while she was dying, why did you ever say, why me, Lorraine? And my mother said, no. Uh, I never, she never said that. She used to say, Steve Jobs had all the money in the world and he died of cancer. So she, she just never said that. I, I, you know, if I had stinking thinking growing up, my mother would always make us go to the mirror and say positive things about ourselves. And if we ever said anything negative, she would say, cancel, 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 cancel. So I still say cancel, cancel. And so Joseph Campbell, that movie about finding Joe, it, it really resonated with me. And one of the stories I'd love to share since Bill asked me about this movie or about Joseph Campbell is not only do I look at it as when something bad goes on, I go, well, here's my hero's journey. Oh, my car was just repossessed. My babysitter couldn't believe why I wasn't freaking out. I go, I think it was towed out of the driveway. And she's like, how are you not like freaking out? I go, oh, it could have just saved my life. Maybe I was going to get in a car accident today. Like, I, I don't worry about that stuff. No, like, I'm on a hero's journey. That, that car being towed is, is my call for adventure. Here we go. I can't wait to see. And I know once you get the elixir at the end of this hero's journey that Joseph Cando calls it, you come back, you, have the, you get a mentor along the way, you fight these dragons, you're the dragon, right? And you come back with this elixir and all this information, and you're so so much more a better version of yourself than you ever were before. And I get excited about it. So my favorite part of that movie about Finding Joe is this, that there's this community. I, I don't know if it's Thailand or something. Some it, It's like in Asia and, and the pirates are coming and they're gonna, they see all the pirates coming and they have this big golden Buddha statue on the top of a hill. And they're like, oh my gosh, the pirates are gonna steal our golden Buddha. And so they go taking all this stick and mud and they start making it look like it's just a mud Buddha and they cover it up with mud and sticks and leaves. and years go by and they don't take it. They don't pillage this golden Buddha because they don't know. It just looks like this mud Buddha and they don't even touch it. And a year goes by, 10 years, a hundred years, a couple hundred years. So many years have gone by that no one even knows that there's a golden Buddha under there. No one knows because all the people that knew were dead. And these kids are playing up on the hill and they throw a ball and the ball hits the golden Buddha or hits the mud Buddha and a little teeny piece of mud falls off and they see a sparkle of gold in there. And as you might imagine, they, they start to just pull off all this mud. And what we realize in the, the metaphor here for life is that we are all the golden Buddha. And all these things that have happened in our life, they just kind of pile on. And if we could just pull off all the mud, all the stinking thinking, something really beautiful has been created underneath. How my mother would tell this story in her own way is she loved those ocean rocks that you get on the shore of the ocean. Most people turn them into worry stones. And, as, and I want you to imagine walking through the woods and you see a rock in the woods, like the hard rock with all the edges. Do you pick up that and say, oh, this little one inch rock, I'm going to keep this in my pocket. No. But the ones that are in the ocean, they are beaten and pummeled and smashed about. The way they get smooth is the more hits they take, the smoother they become. And the smoother they become, the more valuable they become. In life, the more hits that you have, if you just keep saying, I'm on this hero's journey, or I'm becoming more valuable, I can't wait because at the other end, something extraordinary is on, my, on, on its way. It just changes the way you look at your suffering. It changes your way of... Um, looking at, I'm just in pain and I know something beautiful is going to come out at the other end. It can't not, it can't not. So anyway, that's, that's why I love Joseph Campbell. I don't know much about him other than what I've shared there and in watching that movie so, so, so many times and in saying to myself, I remember traveling through the airport with my two little ones. Um, Jack was a newborn. Charlie was 14 months old and I have to take them out of the carriage. I'm traveling by myself no one, you could see him crying. I cry all the time, by the way. It's not, I'm already through menopause. So it's not, I, I'm not a menopause and I don't have my fear. You're like, well, she's, emo I'm just an emotional person. <laughs> so I, I'm going through the airport. No one's helping me. I have to collapse my carriage 
So you push this button, I have to collapse it. I have to somehow get it on the conveyor belt and I'm holding a newborn baby, two weeks old, and I've got this little toddler and I'm trying to do this and no one's helping me, nobody. And, and I remember thinking, okay, this builds character. This is another wave smashing me into, into another rock and I'm gonna become valuable on the other end. I'm gonna to become tougher on the other end. And I just always think that I'm just on my call for adventure. I don't know. I yeah, think that's, that's great. I feel I feel the same yeah. way. If you get a chance, um, probably better to listen to than read. But the hero of a thousand faces that was okay. his. Uh, that was the opus to the hero's journey, and it explains mm-hmm. all the the way that he's done that. But I I I saw Finding Joe and some other things, and then read that and did the same thing that you did was, you know, they're just adventures and we don't want to have boring lives. Everybody wants to go to comfort, but comfort's not, you don't grow from comfort. You can rest for a second, yeah. you don't grow. Yeah, you know, my mother, when she, when she found out she had breast cancer, everyone started giving her a pep talk. And uh, she goes, you know what? I'm not up for a pep talk. I want to feel like a victim for 24 hours. And I think it's okay. There's a famous quote out there, and I forget who says it. And, and Bob, maybe you know, or, or Bill, it's something along the way lines of, um, I don't, I, I don't, I don't release my thoughts and feelings. I welcome them in, and they release me. Mm-hmm. And I don't know who said it. Uh, it's not me for sure. But I don't release my thoughts and feelings. I don't suppress them. I don't ignore them. I welcome them in. And then they release me. And for me, you know, I've been in a loveless marriage for a long, long time, long time. My husband created a Tinder account five years ago and ended up showing up on my friend's account in DC who called me and said, what are you doing? I go, I'm at home. And she said, I want you to open up your computer. And she sent me screenshots and I'm looking. And at this point, my marriage was over. I was dead inside, you know, I didn't cry. I didn't get angry. My husband walked down the stairs on a split level house. It was right here. He walked down those stairs and he's, what are you doing? I go, evidently I'm looking at your Tinder profile, evidently. And in the last week I've cried probably like five days and not because this marriage wasn't for me, but all the time that I didn't cry, all the time that I was kind of in, you know, masculine energy is thinking through emotions. I'm, I have a lot of masculine energy and I'm trying to tap into my feminine energy and feminine energy is through words and processing and emotions in this like fluidness. And so I've been walking around water. So kind of this rebirth, which is so interesting because I, I went to this walk um, at the tidal base and Bob and I were talking before the show started about DC. It's so beautiful. I live in Alexandria outside of DC and feminine energy is the ocean. It's nature, right? So I'm walking around this nature and I start doing a Facebook live and I said, Feminine energy is nature. It's free flowing, right? It's scarfs and, you know, it's just softer. And, and, and then I look over and there's the Washington Monument, the big pencil and I in the sky, I go, that's masculine energy right there, <laughs> right next to the feminine energy. That's the pencil, right? Men are made to protect and serve. They're made to lean forward and women are made to receive and lean back. And so uh, it's interesting how life works out just like that, you know, 321 that came in twice last night. That's amazing. Yeah, that's incredible. That's so good. Very good. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill, for asking about finding Joseph Campbell. When we started this, we started this, I was speaking at Dr. Bill's office, uh, Dr. Bill Janoshek, and I was speaking at his office. We had a room full of people and we're speaking at the end. I said, you know, how many of you guys would like to sit down and have dinner with some of these people that uh, that I've brought up, like Keith Ferrazzi or Les Brown or you know, Jarek Robbins or some of these, how many of you guys would like to just sit down and have dinner with them and be able to ask them any question you want? That started at 10 years ago, going on 11 years. No. Uh, for 10 years. I'm taking a picture. Oh. I'm taking a picture of us. Oh, cool. Someone said, what are you, someone said, what are you working on? And I'm going to send this picture so they know awesome. exactly what I'm doing. I'll, I'll that's send awesome. So that's where it all began. Yeah, I love it. And I love that it's called Next Level. Yeah, Next Level by Association. It was basically formed out of the, the foundation that Jim Rohn talks about. You are the average of the five people. So we said, well, what if we created an intentional peer group, an intentional five people? but expanded beyond five. And uh, so 11 years later, we're, we're in the in our 11th year. And until last year, we had dinner once a month on the third Thursday of every month. And so but then last year with COVID, it happened. But 
uh, we had already been starting to do some some virtual stuff anyway, so it worked out really well. But um, well, yeah. listen, I, listen, I I want to I want to just tell you something because I'm so honored that you have me here. Is that I told you I'm my best version of me when I when I serve others and and. Um, I, I want to, I'm not going to sell something, but I want to, I want to give something to you guys and, and not with a hidden agenda, which is this, no, is, I, I just started a class, um, this past Wednesday, 7 PM East coast time. And it's an eight week course called seven levels of reading and influencing human behavior. It's emotional intelligence made easy. And I've already sold the course, but it's already started. It's on zoom. I can take as many Zoom people as I want. So any of your people that are watching, so it costs $2,000 to do this class, but you can come in free as my guest because Bob cares about you and he's taking you to the next level. So I'm already hosting it. We have about 25 people in there, so I can go up to a couple hundred. Yeah. So any of your people that want to come in that class, just reach out to Bob or reach out to Flo on your team, however you want to do so it. How do you want them to reach I'll out? I'll send you the link. How do you well, want oh yeah, reach out to me. There you go, Janine. So my Janine at liontamer.com. So I don't know if Flo wants to put it in there. Janine, J-A-N-I-N-E at liontamer, L-Y-I-N as in nickel, T as in Tom, A-M as in Michael, E-R.com. Um, so, or just go to my website, janinedriver.com. Yeah, that's it, Janine at liontamer. If you want in then the class, I'll send you the Zoom link. The only deal is you can't tell the people who paid that you're here <laughs> as Bob Donald's guest here. So yeah. I'd love to have you because the more people, the merrier. And I, it's not just me. I have um, someone that worked with Do Dr. Paul Ekman, a guy named Dr. David Matsumoto, who went out to the Athens Olympics to prove blind, -sighted, blind and sighted athletes show up the same body language when they win and they lose. And um, he's one of my special guest speakers. I have a guy from the FBI behavioral unit. His name is Frank Marsh. He mm -hmm. does one of the sessions along with me. I'm there with him. And he talks about handwriting analysis, statement analysis. He analyzes the Jean Benet Ramsey ransom note. It's unbelievable. He analyzes mm -hmm. tattoos, what they mean. Talks about the language that you're using that's hurting your executive presence. And um, really extraordinary. So you could get to come in as my guest. You just that's can't cool. tell anybody um, because I know that there's at least one person here that this will change your life by being in that program. So uh, on behalf of my mother, I would love to give you guys that gift to come join yeah. us and play if you're interested. And, and it's three hours. So it goes from 7 p.m. East Coast time to 10 p.m. East time East Coast. But this year, this week, we went over to 11 because I had an un unannounced guest that showed up. Oh, man, that's amazing. Thank you so much. That will yeah, be yeah. Uh, that'll definitely be a treat for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll, I'll take one more question. If you guys have a question. Uh, and then we'll, we'll let her get on since she's on East Coast time, guys. Um, but uh, I, th I think Michael had a question. Hi, Michael. You there? Can we unmute him? Do we have to? Do we have to help him? No, he might be. Uh, he might have had to get into his car by now or, or something. I'm not sure. Um, if you come back on, Michael, let me know. Uh, oh, he's driving. Okay, yeah. Keep your oh, eyes okay. on. Stay focused. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, what, what are ways that people would like to, or that you would like people to engage with you? I mean, is there an email? Do you like to do, you know, what, what do you like to do? How do you like people to engage with you? All right. Uh, I'm just telling my babysitter him I'm almost done. Uh, so my website, of course, is janinedriver.com. Okay. I'm also on Facebook as janinedriver.com. On Instagram, I am new body language. And I would love, if you're not already on this platform, please come over on this platform where Bob and I met, which is just really amazing called Clubhouse. It's still in beta, so you have to be invited in, but you can go in and create your name. Um, you can follow me. I have a show there uh, Monday through Friday. Monday through Thursday, it's all free. And if you haven't seen it, it's almost like a radio show or a podcast where you get to interact. I love it. It's my favorite inter way to interact. I've only been on there two weeks, Bob, is that go to go to this this room. And what you do, my room, I, my show is every Monday through Thursday, 4.30 to 6 p.m. And it's called the New Body Language Show. And so today we talked about um, a hierarchy of criteria. What's more important than something else and how to figure that out? Because your subconscious knows the answer, but your conscious is getting in the way. And so if you keep making kind of stupid decisions, it's be, it's only because it's not your fault. It's your your subconscious is knocking saying, hey, I know what I know how we can get out of this pattern. I know how we can get out of this loop. So we talked about what is that exercise, how to do it. Um, and we also talked about nose touches and what it means with different ways of touching our nose with our hands versus a finger versus two hands. So we did nose touching today. We did today something called tut-tutting. Do you know what tut-tutting is, Bob? I don't, I don't. All right, if you, were getting, if you were at the Thanksgiving table as a little kid and your mother or your grandmother was not happy with you, 
and they would do this with their finger, what sound effect would they make? They're rubbing their two index fingers together. Like a, a yes. Yeah. That's called tut tutting. And as adults, it's we're in trouble. And so as adults, we tut tut when we're not prepared. We don't like your question. Stress has, has gone up a little bit. It's like, it's like our grandmother saying, you're in trouble, young woman, young lady, young man. And so anytime you tut tut, and Anthony Weiner did this, he was being asked about the whole Weiner gate and he was tweeting pictures of himself in his underwear to young girls. And then he went to jail for it. Mm -hmm. Young girl first in Seattle and then some other people along the way. And, and when asked questions by the media, he said, I've already answered this question. And mm -hmm. so as soon as you hear that, you know, like stress is super high and, and you yourself, I like it less about reading it for other people, more about reading it for myself. And so when you ask me a question and I go, um, well, mm -hmm. how I got on the Today Show, um, and I do that tut tut, as soon as I say that, I stop and I say to myself, oh, wow, what am I uncomfortable about sharing here? Mm -hmm. Because God made me with five I am's. I am open. I am truth. I am a healer. I use my comedy to heal, right? I am power and I am generosity. So I am open. I am truth. I am power. I'm a healer and I'm generosity. And I live through these five I ams. Oh. And so anytime I tut tut, I go back to my core values of these five. And I'm like, which one of these is, is feeling out of sync right now? Cause I just tut tutted. So what it, what's what's the what's the problem here? Am I not being generous with my information? Am I not being open? Am I about to give someone a dig about you can find that you can find that information out on my website? Just hit Google. Am I about to insult somebody? Because my humor is to heal, and so my my subconscious will stop me with a tut tut mm -hmm. to say stop. Are you being the best version of you, of who I am? And you may not be my people. You may not have my five I am's. In order for you to be my people, by the way, I have to. You have to. I have to see these five things in you. If you don't have one of these, if you're not truth, if you're not open, you're a private person, you share nothing with anyone, but you want to get everything from everyone else. You always take, 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 but you never, never share and say, here, take what you need because your power is what you give to others. If you don't have that belief, that's fine. You're just not my people. Yeah. yeah. That's a good yeah. to know. So well said. Thank you so much. Janine, I have, uh, I, I heard you on Clubhouse. I loved you there. I was like, I've got to reach out to her. I love you back, man. So, so glad that we had this opportunity. I want to spend more time with you uh, and, and learn more uh, from you and about you. You are an amazing lady. And uh, oh, I just you. want you to know that um, uh, your, your gifts, amazing. Uh, but who you are and how you're showing up um, far exceeds even those amazing gifts that you have. Well, yeah. listen, I know you're my people. I looked up your backstory and I saw that, you know, you, your father was gone. Your mother died at a young age. You lost your daughter at, in a weird car accident at three. And, and then you just, you just turned your life around with this positivity mm -hmm. to go help and give. And I have a funny feeling you're the best version of yourself when you're, when you're serving others as well. And, uh, one of the reasons I said yes, despite my kids being upstairs and 11, 15 here is, um, I had to say, yes, you're my people. I, I felt that you were, you're, you're open and you're generous and you're a healer. What you're doing heals mm -hmm. people, giving them this amazing information. And, uh, and you're certainly powerful, my friend. And I'm so glad we're connected and, and thank you for sharing me with your world. And it's been an honor. It's been an thank honor. you very much. I appreciate you and I look forward to more con connection with you. And thank you. And I'm sorry for your unimaginable losses. Unimaginable, thank so you. sorry. Yeah, I Thank said a prayer for you tonight before we started, by the way. Very sweet. I appreciate it. Yeah, I did. All right, so, everybody. I, I see some chat here. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, so people, this is just from Flo. Okay. Oh, Flo's had some, and uh, Bill had to bounce out for another uh, meeting, uh, and Michael was driving, so we got some of those information. But, uh, you know, we're going to put you in, look for an invite to be part of Next Level by Association, uh, the Facebook group. Yes. Um, we have about 79, 80 people in there right now. And uh, I always cool. bring the guest of honors to be a, a member as well, if they, if they choose to be. But uh, so you'll have that invite in your mailbox the, the, this evening or in the morning when you wake up probably. But um, feel right. free to uh, accept that and participate and um, people will be asking you questions. They'll watch back, watch the replay. So, um, but thank you again. Thank you for who you are. Um, incredibly impressive and uh, absolutely love yeah. your heart. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. I love right. you. Get out there, make it a great week and enjoy your next level. Thank you. Thanks, Bob.